Welcome back, economists. So today we're going to be talking about Chapter 8 in our international economy uh, class. Um, so we're going to basically be looking at regional trade agreements. So we'll talk about the European Union. We'll talk about NAFTA. We'll have some calculations thrown in there for this exam or for this chapter. So there's going to be three parts. We'll have the intro, we'll have the calculations, and then we'll talk about the European Union and NAFTA in separate videos. So just make sure you watch all the videos um, pertaining to this chapter. So in this chapter, we're going to cover regional integration versus, versus multilateralism, types of regional trade agreements, um, impetus for regionalism, so basically forces that drive this. Um, uh, why would you want this? We'll talk about the European Union, um, economic costs and benefits of common currency, and also NAFTA. So I'm not going to talk about every single topic, but the stuff I do cover are going to be important for future assignments, exams, quizzes, and the final as well. So we're going to start by talking about World War II. So um, since World War II, advanced nations have significantly lowered their trade restrictions. So we've seen studies that show when you lower your trade restrictions, you lower tariffs, um, lower quotas, make trade much more accessible, everyone prospers. And this could be due to comparative advantage, um, different endowments that you have available to you. Um, so reciprocal reduction of trade agreements through uh, the GATT. So there were also international entities that helped reduce these trade barriers. And because of this, we saw an increase in productivity, efficiency, consumption, production. There was a lot of benefits of this. Now we're gonna start diving into a much more uh, smaller scale um, type of agreement. So now it's not an international, it's not as much as, or it, to an extent it is international, but now we're gonna be talking about a couple countries joined together or just in a certain geographical location. So for example, NAFTA, you have Canada, Mexico, and the United States, European Union, you have all the countries within Europe for the most part that are part of this agreement. And these agreements are very similar to these international entities. The goal is to make trade much easier, more accessible, and be able to increase productivity consumption. And we'll see why it's good and also why it's bad. So with regional trade agreements um, or arrangements, member nations agree to impose lower barriers to trade within the group than with non-member nations. So basically if you're part of the group, it's really good. You have lower trade restrictions, it's easier to trade with these different countries. But if you're outside of the group looking in, it's much harder to trade. So we'll talk about different examples of this, why you want to be a part of this trading arrangement as opposed to being outside of it. So um, regional integration versus multilateralism. So the major, the major purpose of the World Trade Organization was to promote trade liberalization through global agreements. So they very they like to push for these regional trade agreements as well as having this global economy. Again, the more um, open we are to trade, the better it is for the global economy as well as regional, local, um, however you want to break it down, it's much better. Now, getting various countries to agree to these agreements is very difficult because Everyone has their own take on trade. Everyone has their own um, philosophies. Their economies are run different ways. They have different rules, regulations. Some countries might be a command economy. Some countries might be a free market. Um, some people might like capitalism. The others might like socialism. There's different ways to go about this. So by the early 2000s, the WTO was stumbling. Again, varying thoughts. Getting everyone on the same page is a very difficult thing to do. Countries increasingly look to regional agreements as alternatives. So we saw an increase in these regional trade agreements because it was hard to get everyone else on board as opposed to individuals in your own area. So countries in their own area have or are enduring the same hardships or might be facing same the same uh, problems, whether it be in the market, um, financially, and so forth. So again, regional trade trade agreements were the alternative to having this overarching global economy. So number of regional agreements has risen from 70, which was in 1990, to 300 today. So it's covering over one half of international trade. So we have NAFTA, we have European Union, there's a lot of other um, trade agreements, but those are two we're going to focus on. Now regional trading blocks are discriminatory. So some of these blocks decrease uh, discretion, uh, discretion of member nations to pursue trade with outsiders. So basically, if you're part of NAFTA, let's just say, there's favorable treatment for Canada and Mexico, if you're in the United States, compared to, let's just say, Brazil. So again, it it helps reduce or it increases discrimination and um, mostly due to not being a part of that um, agreement. 
So one regional benefit, once regional benefits receive little incentive to sign a multilateral WTO agreement, um, that would negate those benefits. So again, if you can get those same benefits through a regional trading agreement, there's no incentive to you to go to the WTO and have to go through this long process. And we'll talk about that in the coming weeks as well. So you can foster global market openings. So let's just say you can't, you don't have access to a certain market. Now you do through this agreement. So let's just say Mexico um, wouldn't have access to Canada's market because we have NAFTA. They can access that market. They can make use of their um, their products, their labor, their ideas. Having trade with them makes it easier for Mexico to consume more and produce more, and everyone wins in this case. So regional agreements agreements may achieve deeper economic interdependence. So we talked about economic interdependence in the beginning of the semester, basically how how um, how reliant you are on other countries. So basically, let's just say we want to use Mexico for cheap labor um, in the United States. If we use that cheap labor, it's going to help produce. Um, we can produce more goods because we're paying less um, for labor intensive products or um, labor itself. Now, also their self-reinforcing process is set in place by the establishment of a regional free trade area. So if we have a free trade area, that's basically saying um, there's not going to be any tariffs, no taxes, no regulations. It'll be much easier to conduct trade. Now, regional liberalization encourages partial adjustment uh, of workers out of import competing industries in which the nation's comparative disadvantage is strong and into exporting industries in which comparative advantage is strong. So basically, um, Let's say before this agreement, you are really good at producing a labor intensive product um, and you don't have access to any capital. With this, um, you have access to capital because of your trading partners. They can take it, uh, you can take advantage of their accessibility for these capital intensive products or this capital in general, and it makes trade easier. And then basically, you can um, produce more. Also, it's going to focus your time and energy on stuff that you have a comparative advantage. Um, in so again comparative advantage is just looking at who who can produce something um, By giving up the least amount. So now we're going to export only products that we have comparative advantage in we're only going to import products that we have a comparative disadvantage in and Both sides win in this case and we've done those calculations before in the beginning of the semester So economic integration this is a process of eliminating restrictions on global trade payments and factor mobility so it's easier just to make trade um, happen and it unites two or more national economies in a regional trading agreement. So we'll talk about the different types of um, agreements in the next slide. So we have a free trade area. So a free trade area has all tariffs, all tariffs and non-tariffs removed among members. So there's no quotas, there's no, um, no quotas, no tariffs, um, no trade restrictions. Trade is easy easily done among all members. So the next type of um, trading arrangement that we have is a custom union. So basically all tariffs and non-tariff barriers are removed among members. Each member nation imposes identical trade restrictions against non-participants. So if you have a trade union or if you have a custom union in every country in this, um, that's a part of this deal, you all have the same policies against other foreign competitors. If they're not a part of this union, then you have the same policy. If you don't, this isn't going to be a custom union. So an example would be Benelux. So this is basically a agreement between Luxembourg, Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and Germany. Basically, they have um, reduced trade barriers and they Im impose the same policy. So if, let's just say um, France um, imposes a tariff on the United States. That means all the other countries that are involved in Benelux, so Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, they're all going to impose the same type of tariff. They're going to have the same exact blanket policy across the board. Um, and this is an, another example of the European Union as well, is a custom union. So they have the same policies. And we'll talk about a couple more. So we have a common market. So this permits free movement of goods and factors of production among members and applies um, common external trade restrictions against non-members. So when you look at um, a common market and you compare it to a custom union, 
Um, for the most part, you could say a, a European Union is, to an extent, a custom custom union. But the only uh, difference is some of these countries in the EU don't have the same blanket policy um, for non-members. So this is where the main distinction is. Again, they there is an overlap, but the the main um, difference is European Union countries don't all have the same um, policies when it comes to um, imposing a form of trade barrier. So if you were asked on a quiz, um, what is the European Union? It's much more a common market. So in the EU, you're allowed to ship from country to country. Um, you can work in any of these countries that are part of the EU, and it's much easier compared to um, other types of trading agreements. Now, economic union, national, social, taxation, and fiscal policies are harmonized and administered by a uh, super, supranational institution. So basically, you have a hierarchy. They impose all the policies that are going to be implemented by all of these different countries or participating parties. Now, monetary union. Oops, sorry. Monetary unions is the unification of national uh, monetary policies and the currencies in, uh, administered by a supranational um, entity. So, for example, the United States this is something that we have. We'll talk about this when we look at NAFTA. Now, impetus for regionalism, basically the driving force. Um, what's the pros? What's the cons for this? So the motivations for this trading arrangement is you have much more economic growth. So economies of large scale production. So more countries are involved, increased production, lower cost. Um, they're going to have specialization. And we know with specialization, you decrease your cost, increase your efficiency, and also learning by doing. This is basically an idea that let's just say the United States, we're really good at producing products. We know how to use capital intensive and labor intensive as a mix. And let's just say another country that we have a trading arrangement with doesn't really know um, how to use um, certain type of capital. So let's just say, for example, Mexico, they have less technology available to them. So if the United States set up shop in Mexico and they show them how to do things, they're learning by doing. And then eventually they'll catch on and they'll be able to produce more and more and understand this technology more and more throughout time. Also, you have an increase in foreign investment. So other countries can invest into your country. You can have foreign portfolio um, investment or foreign domestic investment. Those are different ways to go about it. Um, there's a variety of non-economic objectives. So the management of immigration flows. We'll talk about this with NAFTA. And then also the promotion of uh, regional security. So if you're, um, if you're trading partners and you're in an arrangement, um, it's in all your best interest for everyone not to have any conflict and support each other in times of need because if one benefits, everyone else benefits as well. And you also want to enhance and solidify domestic economies. So we'll see why this is so important with NAFTA and the EU. So in the 1950s, the Western or Western European removed tariffs and exchange restrictions um, as counterproductive. So, so there was a Treaty of Rome, the European community became the EU. The primary goal was to make trade easier. Trade liberalization, it was a economic liberal ideal. This um, became popular in Europe before it became popular in the United States. So the original members were Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and West Germany. So again, this was the Benelux. Again, it got um, more countries joined over time. So they were pursuing inter economic integration, the objective of becoming an economic union. So in 57, they um, were focused on trade liberalization. In 68, free trade area. Um, 70, they became a custom union. And then 1985, they announced a program to form a common market. And in 1992, there was an elimination of all non-tariff trade barriers. And in 2002, the European Monetary Union, or the EMU, and they created a single currency. So this was really big. They created the euro, and they also had um, the Maastricht uh, Treaty. So this treaty was the alignment of economic and monetary policies. So basically, every single one of country, one of the countries that were involved in the EMU or the European Union, as they call it now, um, they have the same policies. They're governed by this central bank, and we'll talk about those in a bit. So the convergence criteria stuff they had to meet was. Price stability, low long-term interest rate, stable exchange rates, and sound public finances. So they can't be um, misusing their funds or um, being in, uh, in tremendously in, uh, or having a huge amount of debt. So 
that was the goal of this um, treaty. Now, the EMU emerged with the common currency in 2002. Euro is the official currency of 18 of the 28 members in the nations over the Eurozone. Here we have a list of all these countries. Um, and then the countries that maintain their own type of currency is the UK, Denmark, and Sweden. Now, the Euro is used worldwide, and it is important. Now, when we talk about our different currencies in chapters 10 and 11, we'll talk about um, the Euro compared to the dollar, compared to the yen, and so forth. Okay, so this is going to be the intro. Um, the next video is going to show you how to cal do some calculations um, and the benefits of having a regional trade agreement. So we'll look at Germany, Luxembourg, and the United States as three countries. So I'll see you guys soon.